Hey guys, so we're going to go through the process of setting up Vanilla Blender so you can use it a little bit more efficiently and a little bit more effectively. Now this is really for you guys that have been watching some of my videos. Uh, you don't have add-ons, you're not you know, planning on buying add-ons. Blender comes with some pretty good add-ons out of, out of the box. So you just have to enable them and you already have it. So let's get started here. First up, uh, I'm going to go ahead and change the window to full screen. Uh, just to get started, but let's go to edit preferences. Now you don't really have to modify a whole lot of preferences by default. Um, let's go ahead and just, uh, we're gonna go down to key map. I'm gonna do tab for pie menu. This is personal preference, but I prefer it. And also spacebar action is set to tools. I like using this. And um, under system, if you're gonna render with cycles, use the uh, appropriate option here to uh, enable GPU rendering with cycles. Okay, and so, other than that, you really don't have to change anything. Under save and load, when you save your Blender files, if you get a .blend1 file, that's the save versions. It's kind of like a little backup for you. Um, I don't really use it, so I turn that off. I've only had maybe two or three Blender files go corrupt where that would have saved me from having a, uh, a problem over the course of like six years. So, I mean, it's not really a big, big issue in my opinion, but if you are running into errors when saving and stuff a lot, definitely leave the save versions on. I think that'll help you out quite a bit there, so. Um, other than that, yeah, you don't really have to change anything in that, that setting or these settings there, but we're going to use some add-ons. Uh, first up, bull tools. This is a huge one. Okay. Turn on bull tools. Now, uh, under its options, display as wireframe and you're good to go. Okay. Some other ones you might want to turn on loop tools, uh, node wrangler. We're not going to get into all of these in this video, but some that are pretty important. Type in image and you'll see that we can do images as planes, which is nice. And type in extra and you'll have some extra objects you can add, which can be quite good. There's also one that's quite interesting, which is geodigic domes. You might find that interesting or things like bolt factory. It's extra stuff you can add really. But those are quite nice. And if you're gonna do some rigging and stuff, probably rigify at some point, right? That's where you find this. So. Uh, turn on the add-ons you want, you know, exit out of that, and you can just kind of browse through all these and see if any of these pique your interest. And how you identify these things and where they're located is it says location, view 3D, add lights, right? So if we were to turn on the tri lighting, you'll see here, uh, view 3D, add, and lights, three point lights, okay? So that's how you're finding these things. It's usually, if it says 3D view, it's somewhere in this 3D view area. Um, you might have to press in. It might say like 3D view edit. That would be down here. Okay. Um, oh, one we didn't turn on. Let's go back real quick. This is kind of a, a big one as well. Uh, so if we turn on auto mirror, look for auto mirror, turn that on. We're good. That's going to pop up over here. When we press in, bring out that side panel. We can see now under edit, we have auto mirror here and bull tools as well. Uh, bull tools you actually can access by hitting control shift B. So you can get to it here as well. And so I'm not going to use this one personally, but um, if you right click auto mirror right here, you can pin it. Go back to item, you'll see it's pinned, right? So we can drag it down below our location, rotation, and scale. And so we'll always have this available right here to use. Now auto mirror is a little bit weird. It's a little bit finicky um, on how it works. But generally speaking, um, you could kind of, tweak it and configure it for all kinds of different arrangements of using the mirror modifier um, where it like cuts and mirrors or it doesn't cut in mirror. It's there's some number of different things it can do, but it's really good for us using it as a symmetrized tool. You know, it's not hard to set up a mirror modifier in general. So using it as a symmetrized tool, it's actually more effective. So that's what we're going to do with it. Now let's set up the scene here real quick. Uh, we're going to go ahead and press X here and X here, delete the light in the camera. I don't like the grid being on. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn it off. I'm going to check, floor off x off y off this is what i prefer personally uh, as a beginner this might be a little bit disorienting to you so you could just leave the floor grid on and maybe leave these on too but um, in general if you look at this little icon here as you orbit and you hit middle mouse and orbit around you see uh, it tells you which side's negative y which side's positive y or positive x negative x and positive z and negative z so if you even if you're upside down you would know like this is negative z now well we need to go positive z so that's a good way to orientate, orientate yourself in 3D anyways. Um, negative Y, you should be looking at the cube with negative Y towards you, positive Y towards the back. Um, that's going to actually be how it renders best for the asset browser if you were ever to tag anything as an asset as well. So, um, But I think that's also dependent on like lo local rotation and scale. 
We might get into that here, but anyways. So we got that started. Let's go ahead and configure some other things. Uh, next up, I like statistics on because when I select vertices, I get a vertex count. And I could tell how many uh, vertices I have instead of counting them by hand, just being like, oh, it's one, two, three, you know. We can just click them and then look over there and see what number it is. Uh, wireframe, I'm going to right click. I'm going to assign this to a shortcut. I uh, highly recommend getting a mouse with the four buttons on the left side of the mouse, right? So you have like a forward backwards button and then you have another one that's like a forward and back. Okay. Two sets of two buttons, right? Four buttons. And so assign this shortcut. I'm just going to use um, one of those keys, the back button on that. So I could turn wireframes on and off. This is huge. Because uh, sometimes you're in object mode and you still need to see these things, especially if you're, like, you're in a side orthographic view or something like that. So um, we can turn that on. We can switch to a matte cap, switch to this one here, and that's going to be like plasticity. So that's kind of nice to turn on, right? Or plasticity is like this, one or the other. And um, back face calling. This is when you have your faces are backwards. Um, they'll render transparent if you turn this on. Some guys use the other method, which is over here, which is a uh, face orientation, which will turn the face red. I find that has issues with Boolean sometimes. And also, I never learned using a system like that. So when I was working in Max and all that fun stuff, um, back face calling on was probably the way to go there. So I still use it. I think once you get the hang of dealing with faces that are backwards, uh, with back face calling on at least, it's a lot easier than using the other ones. So. Uh, plus, this will happen in the game engine this way as well. So whenever you identify the issue in a game engine, um, it'll be the same as Blender, vice versa. So uh, cavity on, it's changing it to both. We don't need outline. This actually hurts your performance. Just turn it off. Don't need it. Um, we're going to change this. This is optional. You can change it to random. So every new object becomes a random color. That's that's pretty much what that does. So that's kind of easy and easy to go through. Render settings. You can adjust your renderer as needed. Uh, you can just check these on if you really wanted to. So if you go like shading preview right now, you'll see that this is what we have. Okay. And um, that's that. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else we got to do here? Uh, I'm going to go to the modifier panel just temporarily. Uh, this is where I like my default scenes to be anyway. So what else did we miss? So by default, Blender snaps incrementally. I prefer absolute grid snap, like always. So I always turn this on. That's what, I'm, what I usually do. So that'll be okay. Uh, hit the tab key. That's the tab for Pi menu. I uh, go into edit mode. And so we can press one, two, and three, of course, to select vertices, edges, and faces. Uh, now here's the thing why we're going in this mode real quick. I'm gonna hit control B with selecting an edge, just to bevel it real quick. This little panel down here is always collapsed by default. I'm gonna expand it. And we're not gonna get out of this just yet. Um, instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to the um, UV editing tab. You can see this 3D viewport hasn't updated yet. So we gotta configure this one too if, if you wanna configure it. Uh, back face calling, cavity, set it to both, turn off outline. Uh, you could use a matte cap if you want, but when, usually when you're doing UV editing, you want to see the texture possibly on the model. Um, so a lot of times it's actually better to use studio and just use this pure like unlit looking um, studio light. So that, that'll that work out pretty well there for that. And you could switch this over to texture as well. Uh, so if you had a checker map on this thing, it would actually show up with the checker map. I press N over here, bring out the UV vertex. So when you select something, you'll have your UVs right there. Okay, bevel and edge, you'll see here, bevel, bring it open. So now when you press uh, something, like you select two faces, hold shift, select them, press U and unwrap, that'll expand like so. But also when you come over here, you press U and unwrap, the menus collapse, bring it open. So yeah, Blender's a little weird to set up at first because you got to go through like each little panel if you want to use these panels like this um, and kind of set them up in this manner. Uh, same goes for sculpting here. Uh, like if you want to sculpt with this gray matte cap that comes on by default, that's fine. But you can switch over to the clay one if you wanted as well. Um, that probably wouldn't hurt. The sculpt tools are kind of getting long now. You can see you got a mouse wheel through them. Just click right here and bring it out like that. Okay. And you could do that for the other panels as well if you wanted to. All right. So now we got a nice little configuration going. Last thing here, the animation timeline. Drop it. 
if you're not planning on doing a whole lot of animation right off the bat, uh, this is nice. Also, if like you're doing only cloth sims or physics sims, you can just get away with using this. You don't have to necessarily keyframe nothing, so it's quite good. Uh, after we've done all this, we can press X, delete the cube, shift A. We're going to go ahead and create the cube again. Cubeception, and um, now we can go file, default, and uh, save the startup file. Okay. So that's going to save everything in the scene that we just configured. Also, preferences. Um, by default, it saves on exit. So you might want to force a save every now and then when you change things. Also, if you don't want it to accidentally record saves, you can just turn auto save off and you can force saves this way. All right, so that's kind of nice to do that. Now, some of the shortcuts and hotkeys I like to change. We're going to start with inset. So usually I is inset, right? Um, I personally don't care for that because it's too far across the keyboard. Um, inset's really useful and it's I. So I'm going to right click, change the shortcut, and we're going to change it to W. So now W will do the inset instead of select. Usually W toggles through these. You don't really need that. Leave it at box select. If you control right click, you can use lasso selection, right? So that's not a big deal. But now you can hit um, W to inset and you can hold control, move it in and out if you wanted to, or inset, inset again, hold control. You could do it like extrude along normal basically. Um, but your extrude is right next to it as well. So you can press E. You see how, how interesting I get. Alt E, you have extrude menu. You can do other things as well. We'll play with that a little bit here in a second. But um, so that's just one thing I like to change. Now select up here has a lot of great things in it. Uh, select more and less. Um, they have next active, um, pre previous active. We're going to deassign these real quick. I'm going to put all these shortcuts on my mouse. So um, edge loops here. Uh, edge loops, edge rings, select loops inner region, and select boundary loop. We'll all go on my mouse on those side, left side four buttons, right? So uh, let me see if I remember which ones I need to use here. There's edge loops, change shortcut, this edge rings, select loops inner region. So I'm using this in combo with um, holding shift and alt. So these are control, alt, number pad plus. My mouse has control assigned to it, control number pad plus. So now it's control, alt, number pad plus, shift, control, number pad plus, vice versa. So that gives me the option to do um, edge rings like so. Okay. You don't really need the rings. You can hold control, alt, shift, and click an edge. That'll select rings as well. Um, but sometimes I actually prefer this one. And then also, uh, you can select the loops, which we don't really have it, but you can select the loops now holding Alt and hitting one of those buttons. Uh, so that's going to help you be a power user. Someone was commenting that I, I um, in one of the comments of the videos anyways, that I'm expecting everybody to have a four button mouse. Yeah, I kind of am. And that's true. And so you probably need to go buy one if you don't have one. It's going to save you a huge amount of headaches working in Blender. Just those four buttons alone, being on your right hand, being able to get through the process here. So it's a, it's a big thing because if I select all this here, you'll see it's selected like so, and I um, use one of my shortcuts now. That's select boundary loop. The so boundary loop and loop inner region is also on here. So I can reselect what's inside of that as well. So if I just had like this selection going or I made that selection, right? Yeah, it's easy to get a hold of things. That's all, that's the whole reason that you should go get a good mouse like that, right? It doesn't have to be a great mouse. It could be, you get the idea. Just get a mouse with four buttons. That's all you need. All right, so hmm, what else do we got to do here? For the most part, that's it. Uh, I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to recreate the cube. I'm going to click File, X, uh, Clean Up, and I'm going to cl um, clean up unused data blocks. Take note, it's deleting one image, two meshes, one lights, one camera. When you delete things, it doesn't really get rid of it, all right? You have to purge it. When you exit your Blender scene, normally anything that's not being used or displayed will purge automatically. So when you save your Blender file and exit Blender, it purges. Um, but you can purge it manually because I believe the startup file here, when we default save startup file, um, it doesn't purge it for some reason, I think, if I remember correctly. So just do that, and uh, we're good to go there. Oh, turn off X-Ray. So Alt-Z is X-Ray, by the way. I didn't mention that. Um, preferences, whenever you change a shortcut or a hotkey, 
you have to save your preferences. I'm going to turn auto save back on for a second. So when you change shortcuts or hotkeys, you have to save it, force save it again if um, you turn off auto save there. Uh, if Blender crashes, it, it won't save it either. So just you want to change them, force the save, trust me. And uh, all right, so I know I forgot something. I'm trying to think of it real quick. What was it though? Oh, quick favorites. Yeah, um, quick favorites. So a lot of these things that you want to use, but you don't really want a special hotkey for it, you can sign them to quick favorites. So one of the fun things you can do is add modifiers to that as well. Uh, so you don't have to come over here to the list every time. You can always get easy access to them. So you could do things like maybe you want a weighted normal. You can right click, add to quick favorites. Uh, maybe you want a mirror modifier every now and then, add to quick favorites. A boolean or a bevel, add to quick favorites. Solidify. So you can make like a little short list of just your favorite modifiers real quick by hitting Q. Uh, that's a fun way to work, but you can add anything to this for the most part. So it's not just restricted to modifiers, but this is like a context menu. So this is our object mode, quick favorites, but we can also have quick favorites in edit mode. So if we tab, go into edit mode, uh, we can set up like check or deselect, right? And add that to the quick favorites as well. Now, when we hit Q, we get check or deselect here. Right, that's an easy one to do. Um, but this also works with anything as well. So like export FBX file, right click, add to quick favorites. So now you can easily export an FBX file too. Not a big deal at all. It's like, oh yeah, but we don't have to go over there and click it ever again. Um, so we can do that number. If you press Control S, you can save your scene somewhere. I'll just save it as one. Uh, save the startup file again. Uh, save it preferences. So we're all pretty much configured up here. Like you can make changes as you go along as well. If you find something that you want to do later on, you can do that. So uh, let's get into this little mirror issue here. So I'm going to press Control B, mouse wheel up, bevel and edge. This uh, auto mirror feature, if we go ahead and just click it, you'll see, well, it turns on the auto mirror feature and it mirrors across X. Uh, it's splitting the mesh down the middle though. So if we turn the mirror off, you'll see that it's actually cut our model in half as well. Some people like that, some people don't. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, I don't prefer it, but uh, I'm going to delete it. So we're going to go back and create another cube. So if you don't do the cut and mirror like that, uh, you add a mirror modifier. Whoop. Helps if we bevel an edge so we can see what's going on. And we auto mirror. You'll see that now when we turn it off. Well, I guess it's still cut, didn't it? Let's try that again. Use clip. No, cut and mirror. Turn that off. Let's try it again. Okay. Yeah, like I was saying, it kind of acts a little bit weird sometimes. It's supposed to be doing a mirror, but it's not at all. So use clip. That might be what it is. We'll see real quick. No, it always cuts it. Okay, and that's what was weird about this add-on. Something I didn't like about it. Um, I can't seem to turn that off, I guess. But, all right, whatever the case, let's delete the cube. That's not what you should use it for anyways. Um, instead, you leave it at its default settings, but just click Apply Mirror. It'll never use the mirror then, okay? So we can mirror positive X, which is positive negative X, right? Um, auto Mirror, and we can use it as a symmetrized tool. You see? We don't have to worry about the modifiers at all. So instead of using something like Mesh Machine Symmetrize, you can now use this really easily and not have any issues with it. I mean, that's good because you might want to create some things and do that. Uh, so, for example, uh, let's say you're modeling some kind of like vehicle or something, possibly. We'll just do like the idea of one anyways. And this whole section is like beveled like this. And maybe we just want to auto mirror it real quick. Bam. You see, it saves us a lot of time because now we can come through here. Press K, use the knife tool. Click, click. Right click, spacebar. Alt E, extrude manifold. This only works on like extremely flat mesh, by the way. It's not going to work otherwise. Uh, but we could do that. And because we have auto mirror, bam, it's on the other side now. So we make an adjustment here. We can just keep mirroring all day long. If you need to change it from positive or to negative to positive, you can do that. Um, and then also the axes as well. So if you want to do front to back or up and down, you can change these around as needed. But that gives you the opportunity to go through here and, and do this number. Right? Auto mirror. There you go. 
Um, and because we have shortcuts set up right now, we can get Q. We can just add a bevel. Bam. The bevel modifier is in. Okay. Let's go ahead and drag this and hold shift at the same time to get smaller increment movements. Change the segment count up. And we can get something like this going on rather quickly. It's quite easy to do that too. So that's fun. Press Shift A, create a cube. All right. Go into edit mode, scale it. If you scale in edit mode, uh, it won't adjust the scale here on your object. If you adjust here in object mode, it adjusts that scale. That can sometimes be good or bad because if you do something like this, like you scale out and make it a non uniform scale, if you were to bevel this corner, you see it behaves weird. Uh, you don't want to do that normally. So go ahead and um, press Control A. You can apply scales and rotations. Um, you might want to do locations sometimes, but generally that's going to like zero out your location. So don't do that necessarily. Uh, apply scale here in this case. Now when we bevel, we get that. Okay. So that's that little error a lot of people I don't think have known about or seen in tutorials. But that's the one that will pop up on you for sure. As a beginner anyways. So I can bevel something like this and then I'll select this and then this control shift B. Uh, we can use bull tools. It has shortcuts already. Control number pad plus minus um, and all this other fun stuff down here. But then there's shift control number pad plus minus. These auto booleans are destructive. They don't add modifiers. Uh, brush booleans add modifiers. Okay. So if I do select select uh, control number pad um, minus in this case, that's the subtraction. So Bam. That's what we get. All right, take note that this is happening over here. Okay. The um, the boolean is after the bevel. So if we drag this up, we can actually put it above it as well. And this is going to get you into that idea of that stack workflow um, in Blender that I kind of talked about in another video. The only problem here is, is as you do this more and more, you're going to get a lot of these. And this will have a lot of objects possibly. So um, what I'm going to do is see the double arrows, right click, join areas send that up so we have a lot of room over here we're going to click in this little top left corner and drag out if you drag out and it acts weird just right click it'll cancel it and then try it again um, but we're going to change this over to the outliner okay so now we got a nice long list as well and so we'll be able to find any object we need for the most part we'll have a big area for modifiers we'll be able to work with so as this list can potentially expand quite dramatically uh, we can keep uh, tweaking them and making adjustments and fun stuff like that so all right, so this is going on over here. That's how you use bull tools, ultimately, though. It's just like using box cutter, art option, or whatever, for the most part. Uh, I'm going to induce kind of a little error here real quick, though, so you can see what's happening here. Do a quick Boolean subtraction. We'll pull it above the bevel, okay? And take note of these corners. They're really ugly. Alt-middle-click, you can kind of look around with uh, your mouse like that. Uh, but these corners are really ugly, right? So the bevel modifier under geometry, the emitter outer, you can change to arc. And that'll fix that for that. Um, sometimes you got to turn loop slide on and off as well. That could be quite useful. Right? The loop slide on and off if you need it. And so you can take your mesh, right click, shade it, auto smooth. That's going to make it look a little bit nicer. All your cutters, by the way, these little Boolean shapes, you also have to shade those auto smooth. So I'm going to press A, select everything, shade auto smooth. There we go. You can see the shading looks a little bit wonky. This is because the normals in it aren't doing exactly what we want them to do. So your models are shaded using what's called split vertex normals. And you can see right here in edit mode, you'll get this little drop down section here down. Uh, this very middle one, click it. These are your normals, your split normals. And you can see what's going on here. Um, we look at it from the side. They're actually pretty good. They're, they're not too, too bad right now. Um, but even the little slight discrepancies they have right now, when it's uh, shaded auto smooth, it's causing this little weird error here. It's kind of hard to see what's going on because they don't update in the viewport um, in real time when you're uh, using the modifier we're about to use. But let's go ahead and do this. We're going to add the weight of normal modifier. And you can see that clears it up real quick. So let's see if we can see any result out of this. I don't know if we will. Yeah, when we turn it on and off, like you just you just can't see the end result here for whatever reason. But this weighted normal modifier, we're going to go ahead and check keep sharp. Okay. You do want to check that because sometimes you'll have sharp edges. 
Um, certain places you might want to keep sharp, like maybe this whole section here, control E, mark these sharp. And that splits the vertex normal is what it's usually doing. Okay. But why none of this is updating right now is beyond me. So but that split will cause this to um cause it to have a little sharp edge here basically. Okay, on these areas. You may or may not want that on some things, but we don't need it because we have enough geo here that it's able to hold the shading in these areas. So it's not a real big deal for right now. But if we needed a super sharp edge, because maybe we're making a game model, we can't use any more triangles, we're over limit or something, then we would want to use sharps for sure, things like that. So um, with that out of the way, this modifier stack is growing, like I said it would, right? So um, here's the thing. Triangulate is another one you might want to use quite a bit. Probably add that to your quick favorites as well. Um, so we can add triangulate now. Bam. And it's all the way here at the bottom. Now, I've been using triangulate wrong for some time, actually, believe it or not. And so this is what you want to do. You want to change this minimum vertice count to uh, five. All right. So it's, going, it's only going to triangulate end guns. That's really what you want it to do. Other than that, like the quads will remain triangulated at the end of the day by Blender's kind of default setup. And that's good. So that way, when you take this um, and you want to go to like a game engine or a substance painter, you want it to be uh, all the ingons to be triangulated so that they will render correctly in those other uh, programs. But you don't want to change the triangulation so much that when you bake out your textures or something in substance painter and you bring them back to Blender, um, if you had a triangulate modifier on it, you don't want to have everything going too crazy and, and changing on you, right? When it goes back onto your model, because you probably don't want to keep that triangulate modifier if you don't need it, right? Um, so here's the thing. Check keep normals, though, so that the normals go along with it. Okay, and change it to five. That's the, the proper setup there for that arrangement. Uh, so this should actually work pretty well if you were to take this into other programs now. All right, huge list. Uh, click, drag. You can close all those down like that. You can open in the same way by going up. Right? Get used to doing that. It's not too hard. Press A. You can actually open individual ones. Instead of clicking on that little um, arrow, you just hover over it. Press A. Right? That's another. Close them down the same way by pressing A again. It's kind of a fun one. So, uh, yeah, there we go. We have that going. That's fun. Let's do another cube real quick. Let's kind of fly through this. Oh, let's turn those split normals off as well. I don't need those right now. So, yeah, once you make these little slight adjustments to your arrangement here, or your setup here, you're able to use Blender so much more effectively. Yeah, it's really worth it. Alt-Z to get in the X-ray. Um, as you're orbiting, hit Alt to jump into side views. Um, you do, like, Control-Alt-Shift-S to do that number, right? But you, if you don't select all the way through... You have to hit Alt Z so you can select X ray. Alt Z off. There you go. So if we wanted a slant or a sheared face like this, let's see, you're going to get in the habit of using Alt Z a lot. That's really half the clicking noises you hear, probably, when I'm doing my videos. So, uh, yeah, you're able to do things like this like relatively fast, and it's really not that difficult. Uh, you can see here, I did this um, Boolean, but, well, this Boolean is, needs to go way before that bevel, right? And so now this will also be like so, shade everything auto smooth again. Okay. And so if you can get away with using one bevel, do it. I highly recommend it. Uh, you can add bevel after bevel after bevel, by the way. So if you were to say, like, um, had this one after, you see it cut sharp. You could add another bevel after the fact. You see it put it at the bottom. We want to put it behind that boolean above the weighted normal and triangulate. And you'll see it's doing this number. So we have to change to uh, arc again. And then we also have to hold shift, drag this down, and bump up the uh, segment count here. Okay. Now this bevel might bevel other things. So your first bevel, you might want to increase the bevel count on it quite dramatically. So that you can ensure that it doesn't, like it's using angle limits is what it's doing right now. So you want to make sure you don't hit the angle limit with the uh, previous geometry. And then uh, this new one, you would want to do the same. So if you use another bevel, it wouldn't also, it would also not hit that uh, angle limit, right? 
So you can have two different size bevels on the same object if you really, really needed it. The only problem with this is this is hard to collapse to create a low poly model. Uh, so it takes longer to kind of create your low poly from this thing because you'll have to go through and manually reduce things. Uh, so if you can get away with just using one, do it. It's worth it. Um, but it's not always possible. So sometimes you'll have to do things the hard way. I want to point that out for you real quick off the bat here. And um, yeah, so this is cool and all, but like, what, is it, what does it even mean at the end of the day? Well, we can hide these things, first of all. Press H. We can hide them. Uh, if we move this, they don't move with it. You can parent them if you wanted to. Uh, the only problem with this, though, is that if we parent these right now, they'll end up as sub-objects of the object that we parent to. Um, so sometimes you want new collections. You might press M. Oh, like something. M, create a new collection. Just name it Cutters. Okay. Click OK. These objects, you might want to take them and move them into that Cutters collection. Uh, and the reason for this is so that they don't end up as uh, sub-objects, basically. So, like, if we took um, all of these here, put them in cutters, and select them now, and then shift-click, select the last piece, which is the main piece, Control-P, and we're going to set parent object, keep transform, okay? Um, so now when we move this, they all move with it. If you didn't create this collection, they would all end up under this little drop down here in, in this area like this. Okay. Um, but now you can easily access these things a little bit quicker. And also you can press one and you can hide every collection except the first one or two. Do the same for the second. So when you need them back, you can hit shift two and you can bring them back. Right. Now you're able to use Blender a lot more effectively. And so you can grab this object. We're just going to have a little bit more fun with it real quick. Uh, just to give you an idea of how far you can push your modeling in Blender, at least. Uh, so if you give this like a collision object property here, right? So we make it a collision object. Press Shift A, create a plane. B and Z, go into edit mode, S to scale it. Right click, subdivide. We're going to hit Shift R now. Kind of hard to see this one, but. Right? And this one, we give it a um, cloth property, right? Now check this out. Even though we hid most of the timeline down here, if you're keyframing, you might want to see them so you can pull it back up. But if you're not keyframing, you're doing things like cloth simulation or um, dropping rigid objects or whatever, um, you can backspace, hit play, and there you go. Okay. Now, this thing usually will slide off. So let me prove a point. I'll move it over just a tiny bit. It should be off center of gravity now and it should start to slide down the side. Yeah. Okay. So if you ever have things like that happen, just keep in mind under your main object here, the collisions. There's some things in here you can change, like frictions and this and this, but under um, soft body and cloth is the friction that you probably want to change. So you can bump this number up and uh, see how it behaves as you increase that number. And you can see it just lays down. Okay. And so don't be afraid of using models or playing around with models and being kind of rough with the, what you're creating sometimes. I know it's real, um, it's, a lot of people get really kind of cautious about you know, manipulating things and uh, seeing what they can do with them, but don't don't get too cautious because this plane, for example, if you press K, use the knife tool and just click and drag, right click, hit the space bar. You'll see we have this little section in here now. Uh, it kind of, kind of, can kind of be a little bit hard to select this, but I'm hitting uh, here. Let's do this. Hit Control and click there. Hit Hold Control and click there. Oh, we almost got it right. Let's click right there. Okay. So all of this here, we can do select. Um, whoop, select here as well. We can do that select loops, uh, loop inner region. And that will actually select inside. Press X, delete faces. Now we have like a tear and a cloth, right? That's the basic idea there. There are some triangles and maybe some ingons floating around in these areas. Uh, we can work those out later on if we needed to, but just to prove a point. Uh, we can actually hit the play button and voila. You can see we have like a little dangly bit of a tear there possibly occurring. So uh, there's not a lot of like ripples and stuff going on. So here's another fun thing. We play this, we hit pause. If we pull this back open, you'll see that it's adding like little keyframes all over the place basically um, for the simulation. So we can right click, convert to a mesh, and that will pretty much hold it in place. So if we rewind it, uh, we don't have to worry about that no more. So if you don't have this open, it's kind of hard to see that. But 
Um, once you know it's occurring, you don't really need to see it at all. So we can do things like this because this is a collision object. This was a cloth, um, but we can go into sculpt mode. And you can see here in sculpt mode, uh, I guess I got to expand this one as well, but there's a cloth tool. Okay, and this cloth tool, we can use um, under the brush settings, drag. And so we can kind of drag this thing around, but you can see it's intersecting with the mesh. It's doing that number. Uh, we can also enable collisions here. Okay, and so we should be able to um, drag this thing around and not have it. It might intersect still a little bit, but it won't get too, too crazy. But you can see we can kind of move it around and do some things like that. There's also... Um, Grab here, which could be useful maybe. So you can grab the cloth and kind of pull it around. And do numbers like that. Uh, add a little bit of ripple and curls and effects to it. Not a big, big deal. There's also a mesh filter over here. A cloth filter, should I say? Um, we might be able to use collisions right here. Now we can change it to, yeah, it's got gravity on. So we can click and drag a little bit and it'll start to simulate the gravity like we were using with the actual um, cloth setting over here. But you can do it in sculpt mode as well. You can see it's dragging so it doesn't have much uh, friction and stuff going on but a little bit harder to control in my opinion over here but uh, if just for quick effects you can do that and then switch between the two and kind of tweak and modify this cloth a little bit. But yeah, don't be afraid of your mesh and Seeing what you can do with it. It helps to play around with it. Kind of get an idea of what's going on here. So we can drag this thing all day or grab it. Um, but we can also push it, which is nice. So if we push it, we can get it to like get into these little corners here a little bit better, perhaps. Take note, it's intersecting here. If you're doing static geometry where you don't need cloth simulations and stuff, this isn't really a big deal. Um, the reason for that is because we can go back into edit mode. We can see uh, we're going to select here to here. So we'll hold control and shift. That'll be the shortest path fill selection. Should be able to grab all of this one in this area, maybe. We don't need this bottom one, so alt shift click it. Should be able to hit alt S and just bring that out a little bit. And select little areas and hit alt S. And that's going to scale along normal, so that's what alt S does. Now we are able to kind of reposition this thing, right? This whole section still needs to be redone a little bit. You could also try doing other things perhaps, but shrink wrap eventually. But sometimes it's easier just to go quickly model it a little bit. Right. So you can see how that worked out, right? Uh, you could leave it right there, technically. You could also try adding like a solidify modifier. And we'll push it out instead of in and see how far we can push out. If it's like a thin cloth, so a little bit thicker. Maybe get away with selecting through here and just alt s a little bit. A little hard to see with the um, modifier on. You could turn on the end result here. And that might help out as well, so you can see what you're doing a little bit better. Right. Shade it smooth. And uh, you might subdivide this one again after the fact, but just be forewarned here. When you subdivide this one, I'm going to hit forward slash a second so we can isolate it. Uh, we had ingons and stuff going on, and we don't really want subdivision on or um, the solidify on in edit mode. So we turn it off with those little icons. Uh, we got like an ingon here though, right? And so you need to try to turn these into quads as much as possible. It's going to help out a little bit. So most of this shouldn't be too bad in this particular area, but it could potentially be pretty rough. See, here's a triangle, a little cheap trick here. When you have a triangle on an edge like that, you can subdivide the edge. So select the edge, right click, subdivide it. A lot of times, that's technically a quad now. You can get away with things like that sometimes. So like this one down here is a good example. Subdivide the edge. That's that's good there. All right, so you'll have to go through and clean that whole thing up. 
and maybe merge some things or even back some things off a little bit. You can see like right here, this is weird. I'm gonna do a, um, well, we could do like two sub subdivides here, like for the edges. We can make a triangle real quick. Dissolve, oh, if we can get away with it. We're not gonna get away with dissolving it, I think. So uh, just use the knife tool, I'm gonna press K. So don't pay attention to the triangle, pay attention to what I'm cutting. This here, okay, this shape, it's supposed to be like a square. Um, that's like a an inset of sorts. Drag out to this way, and you drag out to this way. This is a square you need to make. So this is uh, more or less an inset. So I can dissolve these here in the middle now. That's like half of an inset, basically. Right? That's all quads. So that's a reduction method as well, uh, possibly, that you might want to utilize. So we can see that with the solidify on, forward slash, get out of that. So maybe you're making a vehicle or something. See, I hit G and Y, move it forward. Shift, right click, place the 3D cursor, create a cylinder. R, Y, R, X, 9, 0. Okay, if we want to mirror this one, we need to use the mirror modifier. Use the eyedropper, click, done. I'll cross X here. Uh, so we can modify just one and the other one will update. So I can do an inset, inset, hold control, inset again. Alt, shift click, control B, all right. Yeah, so most of my videos, I'm not doing anything special. It's literally vanilla blender for the most part. Although the creature comforts, machine tools, mesh machine, box cutter, hard ops, um, they're fine, they, they work good. But you should be able to do this too, no problems. If you're just getting into blender, there's no reason you can't make all kinds of really cool stuff at AAA quality with the default tools, honestly. It's just gonna be a little bit slower. Um, it can be a lot bit slower if you're working on something real complicated, but um, just learning to manipulate things and work with them and having fun with it. It's really what it's about in Blender. Um, when it comes to pure modeling anyway, it's like, this isn't nothing special to look at perhaps, but think about it, all the, the fundamentals that go into uh, just arranging mesh like in this manner. So watch this video back a couple times, soak it all in. Uh, you'll find that there's all kinds of other little tricks along the way. So when you see people using hard ops or box cutter uh, or anything in their videos, most of the time those add-ons are just tweaking little settings, kind of like that bevel here, right? Like if you didn't know to uh, change mid or outer to arc, you wouldn't know. If you didn't know, you can stack things up and create little orders like this. You just wouldn't know. But that's what most people are doing with the, the hard ops add-on in particular. Mesh machine, on the other hand, um, Machine, the guy that makes it, right? Um, he's, I believe he's a technical artist somewhere. Pretty sure, because usually technical artists do programming and art. So his tools are, I've, I've looked through the code on, on him a little bit. I don't know everything about coding, but my understanding, what I could see, there's a lot of like behind the scenes stuff going on that you just simply couldn't do with regular tools. So like that offset cut feature, uh, there's not really a way to replicate that necessarily uh, with the default tools. So some add-ons really do do things that you just simply, you know, if you want to use them, you're going to need to get that add-on or learn how to code yourself and start writing uh, Python and scripts and stuff, right? So, um, which by the way, you can do right here in Blender. So there's like templates even that you can do, uh, like an operator file import or a modal. So. You get the idea. You can kind of look through the codes here and test them in the console and everything. See what's what's going to happen here. So every time you do something uh, in Blender, matter of fact, I think a lot of the buttons, if you right click them, uh, let's see if you can. Uh, there's a copy a uh, full data path or copy data path. I copy that and let's just paste it here at the bottom of this one. You can see that's the. Uh, that's a way to access it, basically. It's ev.taa render. So that's what that little button does as well. So like Blender is pretty complicated at the end of the day. There's a lot of stuff it can do. Um, definitely learn the script a little bit. I've been playing around with it, trying to get used to doing it myself. Um, it's uh, it's going to be useful, potentially. And so, but learning the model, if you're a beginner, just learn the model for now. You can get into scripting a little bit later on, since it's not required, right? And... Um, Play with some of the uh, add-ons later on as well. Don't be afraid to buy things. If you're trying to do this uh, professionally, you're probably going to want to learn some of those tools um, to, if you're actually doing work, they're useful. But um, 
if you're just learning to learn your hobbyist or something, you don't really need them. But what I showed you here is, is a pretty good, easy way uh, to get started. And so uh, let's just say I went through this whole process here. I like the way everything's going. I like the way the scene is set up. Um, I don't need the objects. I'm going to delete them. Press Shift-A, create a cube again. Oop, Shift-S. Put the cursor back to the world origin. So Shift-S, cursor to world origin. Shift-A, create cube. Tilde key, view selected. Control, little mouse click out, zoom out. Okay. And so uh, we got all these extra cutters, right? We don't need those. We don't need the extra collection. We can clean everything back up real quick. For the modifier panel, this is all set. Okay. Make sure nothing's misconfigured. Okay. File, external data. And, uh, oops, sorry, clean, clean up and uh, unused data blocks. You'll see all that stuff remains, so we're going to get rid of 10 items right now. Bam. File, default, uh, save startup. Right. So we're back to a startup file now. The next time we exit Blender, we come back. It'll load up. It takes a little bit longer to load now because of the additional add-ons, but it's not too bad. We'll always have this arrangement. Always. We can get in and out, and it's always going to be this way. Startup file changes what you change in the user interface for the most part, but your preferences will will save the um, the shortcuts and hotkeys in those configurations. So just keep that in mind. They're a little bit separate, and you have to pay attention to that. Uh, but once you do that, you're pretty much good to go. Like you're you're almost ready to just model anything and tackle anything thrown at you. Uh, however. The M key, when you merge, like it was, I think I said this earlier, but um, assign these to shortcuts too, or, or, or uh, quick favorites wouldn't help you much, but assign them to shortcuts somewhere. Okay, I don't care where you where you assign it, but um, something like, uh, let's try, we'll try one real quick. Let's do M, merge at center, and we'll try assign shortcut, uh, control one maybe. Let's see what that does. It does nothing, okay? So at center, sign shortcut. In shortcut, should I say? Uh, shift one. All right, so we select these two and hit shift one. Nothing happens. So sometimes when you want to use something, you might have conflictions occurring. So you can always go to preferences, key map, check key binding, and you can search for whatever it is you want to use. So if I hit C, CTRL1, You'll see here in object mode, sculpt mode, mesh is edit mode, by the way, just so you know. Uh, 3D view, UV editor, and node editor. Well, we're trying to do this in mesh, right? So what is control one? Select mode. Uh, you can just disable that. And um, that should be fine now. So if we hit this one, merge it at center, in shortcut, control one. Okay. Now we select these two, control one. Bam. So we can set up shortcuts in this manner as well if we really had to. Sometimes you just don't need certain shortcuts. You can unassign them and then take advantage of those keys um, and you won't have any big issues with that. So we could do control one there and then maybe we want to do like merge at last, right? And so maybe we want to do this as a shift one, okay? And we'll see that shift one also does not work, right? So now this is completely optional and this is kind of getting into that territory where you might not want to do this as a beginner. Because uh, shift one in edit mode is going to be selection mode. Fetch select mode one, press spaces, uh, type vertex, extend vertex selection which we don't really need. Okay, and so we can turn that off if we wanted. Some people might use that. I personally don't use that, but um, so you can turn that off. Now, if you hit shift one, you can see it works, right? So that'd be a real fun one to have because now you're, you know, vertex, shift one, merge, uh, control one, merge, and then select vertex, you can press one, right? 
So that's a that's an optional thing, but it could really improve your speed when you're doing things. It's something you might have to do. Some studios you actually get paid uh, by the vertex when you're working. I know a lot of people haven't heard of that one, but it's true. And uh, there's no real way to cheat it. Like you're not able to uh, just do like a subdivide and be like, I made a million vertex. No, it doesn't work that way. But uh, you might get paid by the vertex to do like low poly models. Um, and making different things so that's the difference between working for minimum wage and working for twenty dollars an hour plus is how fast you work some guys made a very good living by creating at a studio like that while other people could barely pay their bills it's just it depends on how fast you are and you're, are you capable of getting through your objects very quick pushing and pulling polygons for the most part and so just keep that at the top of your head when if you're just a hobbyist none of that really matters uh, but these professionals out there, when they're trying to get results turned, they have deadlines, and maybe they get paid by the vertex. This is what they're doing. They're they're going to work. They're producing. They're not just creating art and having fun and doing all that all day. Sometimes they're literally working, and they're working very hard. So um, keep that in mind. If you're just getting into all this and you're looking at be, trying to become a professional, um, keep that at the top of your head. Take it as a, there's a different level between just doing it laxy daisy for hobby and doing things professionally. Okay. So, but these shortcuts and customizing things, not always op, an option at a studio where you can just customize everything. Um, however, the faster you get at working with the tools and understanding the tools, the more often you'll effectively utilize them. Um, so, do, do play around with it at least and try to figure out where things are and how you can kind of. Uh, configure things to to be more efficient for yourself anyways uh, it's definitely useful anyway so that's what this video was really about i just wanted to show you guys how you can kind of set up a default vanilla blender setup that is actually really effective that's really all i wanted to show you because some of you guys don't have that on um, but it doesn't mean you have to be slow either you can be a little less slow um, doing this right so anyways i'll check you guys out in the next one hope you enjoyed and uh if you like the video subscribe leave a like uh, leave a comment or whatever, and uh, I'll see you in the next time. All right. Take care.